So I wanted to make a video about uh, a, something I discovered last uh, spring when I was teaching a class on optimization for machine learning. So we were reading about Lagrangian duality, which is a, you know, a well-studied idea that's kind of core in machine learning. And I discovered something that, that, that I really didn't know before, which is that Lagrangian duals are always concave. Well, they're not always concave, but for any uh, minimization problem, they they are concave, and this is surprising to me because you know the minimization problem could be discrete, or it could be non-convex, or it could be discontinuous. Um, they could have any form, but under any form, the Lagrangian dual is still a convex concave function. So you know, maybe for some of you this might be, be obvious, uh, but to me it was surprising, even though once you see why it's the case, it actually seems quite simple. So let's go through it, uh, and I want to show you why this is the case. So the plan is I'll just, I'll briefly review constrained optimization and Lagrangian relaxation. Uh, presumably if you're watching this video, you probably have seen these things before. Um, and then you know we'll talk about duality, and then I'll get to the argument. And then, and then the the argument itself is, is quite short once you once we go through the definitions. So we'll consider the task of you know minimizing some function f. So this is the pretty standard thing. Uh, I, I'm making the assumption that uh, we're minimizing in the domain of the reals, the real val, uh, real vectors of dimensionality d. But that actually, that actually doesn't matter for this for the for the arguments we're going to make here. It could be the minimization of a variable in any domain. And it's going to be a constrained optimization because this uh, this c function, where, where when we write you know minimize f of x, you know st uh, it means subject to or such that I actually don't know which one it is, um, but it, it's that's that you know the the following uh, clause has to be true. So the following clause says that you know some function c of x has to equal the zeros vector. What that means is there's you know. There's a there's multiple outputs of this this capital C function, um, and each output represents one constraint you might have on the, you know, desired uh, uh, search space you want to consider. So even here, the C function, I'm not saying anything about what the form of the C function is. Right? Typically, we're you know in a lot of optimization problems, we usually use linear constraints. It doesn't matter here. These constraints could be nonlinear. They could be non-convex. They could be discrete. Or pretty much anything else. Um, so, a typical way you might go about solving this is to form a Lagrangian, um, and you start by you start doing that by forming an equivalent, uh, writing down an equivalent form of the same problem, where we still have the minimization over x, but now we also have this supremum over this alpha variable, which has little c dimensions. Where little c is the number of constraints, uh, or the, the the dimensionality of the output of big C, right? So it's the number of constraints, and the supremum. You know, uh, in a lot of settings, you don't often see supremums. I, I don't actually use them that much, so it, it's it's somewhat safe for us to. So it's technically the least upper bound, but in a lot of settings, we can just treat it as a max. Right? A max is almost the least upper bound. You know, kind of by definition. So I'm fudging this a little bit just to make it simpler. Um, so this uh, this expression here, which is the original function value f of x plus you know this alpha vector times the constraint vector, is known as the Lagrangian function. So we define it as L uh, this function capital L of x and alpha. But that's just a shorthand. You just you should remember what you know what the components are whenever you see L. So the trick to Lagrangian relaxation is to flip the order of the min and the max. Right? Originally, you know, above you had this uh, uh, min and max, you know, uh, adversarial fighting against each other, you know, optimizations, and now we switch it around, and now it's a max and a min. And you know, in, under certain circumstances, the, the solution ends up being the same. Uh, let's not worry about that for now. And you know, using the shorthand again, you can we can write it in this form. So, and just to clarify, you can see that the max and min has flipped. So the, the top row was the original problem, um, and the bottom row is the the new flipped problem. So this flipped problem is known as the dual optimization, where the original and the original the original unflipped version was the primal problem. 
it's also, you know, we're thinking about at this point, you know, why the primal problem was, you know, with this saddle point uh, min max uh, was was equivalent to the original problem at the, in the very top row. Um, and and the, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, if that inner max or the supremum was able to choose an alpha to maximize the score, uh, it can always make the score infinitely bad for the, you know, outer optimization that's trying to minimize if, you know, if the constraints are violated at all which, you know, we defined as the constraints being anything non-zero, right? If there's anything non-zero, you can multiply it by an arbitrarily large number and make the uh, score really large. So I mentioned, you know, the question is, when is the dual equal to the original problem? Uh, that happens when you have tight duality. Uh, that's not going to so much be a concern of um, for this video because, yeah, so in some cases you want tight duality. Um, in other cases, you might just want to use, you know, uh, what's, known as a problem with a duality gap, but where maybe the dual might be, you know, more convenient to compute or something. Um, and maybe, you know, I don't know, in some cases, the duality gap may be something you can predict beforehand and okay, whatever. So the point is that, uh, you know, sometimes you have a tight duality, uh, but that doesn't actually matter for this discussion. So just the, some quick visualization so you have, get an idea of what I'm talking about. So uh, I'll go through each of these little pictures. Uh, I'll zoom them in. So uh, the first picture, this is pretend this is your objective function. So this is f of x. So the, the horizontal axis is the input, and the vertical axis is the output. And let's say we're trying to minimize this, which is you know easy. It's one dimensional. Uh, that's because I wanted something I could actually draw on the screen. So th uh, this picture would be you know the constrained optimization. So let's say we don't want anything that's less than 0.24. I think that's where I plotted that. Um, so now, you know, wh where the original optimum was, which is around zero, it's around zero, um, that's no longer a valid solution. So we have to find the, the solution. Now, of course, in one dimension, it's obvious, right? We can see the solution is the boundary, 0 0.25 to 0.24, uh, whatever that is. Um, so, but, you know, in general, in high dimensions, this is not so obvious. And we may have different, a, a large number of constraints. It may not just be one, you know, maybe more than just one constraint, and then this gets more complex. So this is the, you know, kind of like the original view of the problem where we just had this constraint. Um, the 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 new this the Lagrangian style view is where there's a con, there's a constraint function that you know penalizes violation of the constraint, and that's what what's being drawn here. So this is you know on the left uh, the horizontal. The horizontal axis is still x. The vertical axis is now c of x. is the constraint function, and you know that's zero if you're above 0.24. But if it's below 0.24, if x is below 0.24, then you start to incur a penalty based on how much you violate that constraint. Um, and then the Lagrangian, you know, takes a, a weighted sum. Right? It multiplies alpha by this c, um, and you end up with a function that looks like this, right? So this is this is the Lagrangian function, which is the original you know, f of x plus the penalty function, you know, weighted by a score. In this case, because of some arbitrary choice I, I did, you know, I made when I was visualizing this, the alpha is uh, around 2. But the key is that you can change alpha, right? Alpha is a free parameter, to, you know, it's an input to the Lagrangian function, just as x was, is an input to the Lagrangian function. So, you know, in, in two dimensions, because there's one constraint and, you know, one dimension of the optimization, uh, you can visualize this kind of thing. It gets quite hard, quite hard to visualize once you go beyond that. But, um, but here, you know, here's a picture of the Lagrangian function, you know, as you vary the x input and the alpha input. But remember, in the Lagrangian dual function, right, not just the Lagrangian, the, Lagr the Lagrangian dual, we minimize over x. Right, and, and then we solve for, for alpha. So that means that for any fixed alpha, we're going to find the x that that's, gets the minimum possible score. Um, and when we do that for, in this simple 1D uh, function, we get, uh, we get something that looks, that looks like this, where the horizontal axis is now something different. Uh, so, so you know, even though it looks kind of similar, you know, notice that like the horizontal axis is the alpha variable now. Um, and as we vary alpha, the uh, the score that we get for the Lagrangian is um, the result of the minimization over x. So that's what's on the vertical axis now. 
And what we end up now with is now is a, a concave function, right? So originally we had a convex function. We made it kind of, you know, more convex by adding, you know, linear, uh, I'm giving it away a little bit, but these linear Lagrangian terms. Um, but once you, you know, once you uh, do the actual minimization, the inner minimization of the dual function, you end up with a concave function. So this is this is you know this is something that probably is reminiscent of what you might have studied in uh, machine learning if you studied the the support vector machine you know if people are still learning that nowadays for those newbies a support vector machine is like a neural network except it's uh, from the '90s so you know it wears like neon and stuff but this intuition that you we, we often get you know from studying the support vector machine or studying you know convex optimization um, is, you know, we're often taught that uh, the, the, the dual for convex functions is a concave function. And we're also taught that the dual for um, a non-convex function is, doesn't have a, you know, it's not a tight dual. It has a duality gap. So at least for me, whether, you know, it may not be true for everybody, for me, my intuition was that the dual for a non-convex function would also be non-convex. Um, but that's not the case. So that's the whole point of this video. So let's think about now non-convex function. Um, so here's a picture of some mountains. Uh, this is Banff National Park. Um, and let's say we're trying to do con uh, constrained optimization. We're trying to find the lowest elevation point, you know, within this uh, polygon here. So right, like I said, the intuition that people often have, or at least at least I had. So I don't want to put words in your mouths or ideas in your previous brains. Um, but the intuition that I used to have was that uh, you know if we have a non-convex primal function and we take the dual, we're going to end up with something non-convex, and then you know we will have we'll have you know gained nothing from doing the duality. Um, okay, so so this is wrong. This is wrong. So let's let's talk, think about why. So let's look at the equation for the Lagrangian dual again. So this is the equation. So again, the, we're, we at first are saying that you know the outer maximization is over alpha and the inner maximization is over x. Um, so just for fun, let's pre, let's get rid of the inner maximiz maximization over x and just pick an arbitrary x. So let's say x hat is some arbitrary x. So if you look at this function, if you look at this optimization. Um, you know what? What are we trying to do here? We're trying to find the alpha that maximizes this function. You know, which is which is f of x. You know, alpha doesn't even appear in f of x, so it's it's a constant. Um, plus, you know, alpha times c of x, and no, alpha doesn't appear in c of x, so it's just the linear function, right? It's just a linear function of alpha. And you know, if we think about uh, you know what's going on with this minimization, this minimization is is essentially searching over all the possible x hats, right? It's basically saying, you know, for all the possible x hats, give me the minimum sco scoring value. And 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 this the fact that this is linear has nothing to do with what f looks like. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It could be super non-convex. It could be like a like a fractal function that you know. You know, is defined on like rational numbers, but not on ir irrational numbers, or you know something. It could be anything, right? It doesn't matter what f is. It could be arbitrarily complex. And uh, you know, I, I didn't put on the slide, but yeah, the same thing is true about c. C could be anything in this argument. So what you end up doing is you're you know you're just so you just basically take take all the possible x hats, all of them, and put them into a bin. And and now each of those x hats is just a representative of a linear function. So the picture that you, you might, well, so a lot of you might already see that, okay, yeah, this is clearly a concave function. Um, but the reason it's a concave function, or one, you know, one reason it's, you can show that it's a concave function is that, you know, take any of these representatives out of that bin, any x hat from the bin. So let's say this is our x, you get some linear function. So, okay, now we have to, you know, we have to consider this linear function. And then you add another x hat, and there's, there's a different x vector, um, you get a different linear function, you add another one, you get that's another linear function. Um, and you can just keep keep doing this, right? You just keep grabbing all the x's until you until you grabbed 
grabbed all infinite x's, assuming there's an infinite, you know, domain for x. Um, but and once you have infinite x's, you're going to have have built this surface that you know that that's along the uh, the bottom of you know underneath all these linear slabs. And what you get is you know what is technically a piecewise linear concave function, but it's you know got it's piecewise with infinite pieces, so it, it might be continuous. But that that to me is I don't know it's it's not a it's not a proof. I'm just showing you pictures. But that's the argument, and that that uh, is something that you know, like I said, you know, now that now that I see this argument, it's totally obvious to me that. Uh, that uh, the, the Lagrangian dual is going to be a concave function for any arbitrary f, but I never saw it this way before. I, I really didn't see it until we read it, um, read it closely, um, and sort of thought beyond the usual applications of Lagrangian duality. So let me just summarize, and then it will be over. So, so the, the you know the point of this video is just to convince myself that uh, a, a Lagrangian dual is concave uh, for any minimization task. And it's, that's because it's a minimum of a you know, possible infinite set of linear functions. And this is true regardless of the form of the primal function or constraints, right? You know, it can be not, you know, it could be a non-convex function, it could be a discrete function, it could be a discontinuous function. Um, I'm, I want to say it could be a random function, but I'm not sure. I think that might mess things up a little bit. But but it, th this is uh, much more flexible than you know I originally thought when I when I was trained with this stuff by seeing like the dual of a quadratic program and the dual of a linear program, which are you know canonical convex functions. But it does remain open, you know, because there's always going to be a duality gap when you have these you know uh, non nice primal functions. It remains an open question, you know, how powerful this conve concavity is, right? What can we do with this concavity? Um, you know, for for one thing, you can use one of the powers of the uh, Lagrangian dual, dual, which is that it provides you a bound on the objective value. So maybe there's some opportunity to use the lower bound that uh, that the the dual provides, you know, despite the fact that there's a gap. But um, but generally, it's not clear. It's not clear. We, we're we're you know, in machine learning, we're doing non-convex stuff everywhere now. Um, but uh, not so much dual optimization. That's that's sort of not happening that much. But but maybe there's some opportunities to do that. Anyway, I hope this video has been interesting. Uh, this stuff, you know, this was really fascinating. Like like I said, I uh, we we read this in my uh, you know graduate level seminar class, uh, which you know, I'll put a link in the description for the uh, for the course website uh, and the and the blog that the students wrote um, about all our reading for that class. It was really enlightening for me, and you know, it was, it was you know, I, I've generally known a lot about optimization, but um, I don't know, optimization pros might be like laughing at me about this because I'm, I made a whole video about some totally obvious thing, um, but you know, I didn't, I didn't know stuff like this. You know, digging, digging into, it, spending a whole semester digging into it, you know, really, you know, got me a lot more insight into some of the things that we do. Uh, you know, we're as machine learning people, we're users of optimization theory. So spending some time digging into that theory, I think, was a very, very useful uh, experience. All right, that's it.